Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is our very first podcast for Businesses Personal. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much for my guests uh, for joining me. This is Claire Elliott. Okay. Uh, she's CEO of Employee.com. That's M P L O Y I I for those of you who are listening. And this is uh, Lulu Khazanbaz, and she is the CEO of Nabish.com. That's N A B B E S H.com for those of you who are following on the podcast. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. It's really a uh, huge pleasure to have you. Thank you, Thomas. Because we're talking about business being personal, and both of you are digital entrepreneurs and amazing at what you do, by the way. Uh, I wanted to start the topic off with you. I want to talk about why, why we're in business, because that's going to lead us into everything else we discuss in terms of business being personal. So maybe you can just tell us a little bit about why Nabish and why employee. So for me, I had been working in uh, Dubai for around nine years uh, across different industries and different uh, roles as well. And uh, I decided at the time that um, I didn't want to be an employee. Mm. Uh, I felt that there were a lot of gaps in the market, uh, that there was a big opportunity in the region to do a startup and to, to do something, especially in the digital space. Uh, so I decided to take some time off and think about uh, the next steps. And then uh, while I was taking the time off, I wanted to find some consulting gigs uh -huh. uh, so that I can you know, stay in the in the market and uh, continue building my network and so on. And it was very difficult for me to market myself sure. as a consultant because most platforms out there are designed for full-time jobs. Mm -hmm. um, so for me to be able to say I want to work on a project was very challenging. So I had to reach out to my network and you have to do a lot of work to try and find those particular jobs and this is how the idea for Nebbish uh, came about and uh, the idea was really to link people in my situation that don't want to work full time for whatever reason, uh, that have skills and expertise and they just want to work on projects of their mm -hmm. own choosing. Yeah. Um, and that's how Nabish was born. How long ago was it? That was in, uh, so I started working on the concept in 2011 wow. and we launched in 2012. Wow, good for you, yeah. good for you. Yeah. Claire, why employee? Where does that come from? Um, it, it comes from the fact that I've been in the corporate game for a long time, so a well, long time for me. 20 years kind of towing the corporate line, if that makes sense. And um, I decided um, that I wanted to leave a legacy as a bit of a contrived statement, but I wanted to go into an organisation where I can continue being a disruptor mm -hmm. and continue to be a transformation agent. Yeah, good. Because what's important to me is working with clients, working in an organization, working with people where there's a value set in line with my own personal beliefs. Mm -hmm. And whilst, you know, um, I could hopefully uh, transition to most, you know, organizations with my skill set and my background, yeah. for me now it's not about a, a paycheck. I'm quite intrinsically driven. For me it's actually around do I value the values of the organization? Mm -hmm. Can I make a difference? And, Quite rightly, do they value the people within the organisation? Yeah, of course. Um, of course. Do, does everybody buy into a vision? And I think that become that's that's come because of the fact that I'm quietly confident in my own capabilities. Yeah. But also, I'm at that stage where I want to impart. Of course. Um, so that's why I set up employees. So, you know, I don't envisage being a multimillionaire overnight. That would be nice. <laughs> but what I do enjoy is selecting my clients because they're either in line with my values or they're giving me that opportunity to impart them. Mm -hmm. and there's more and more people actually making those kinds of decisions, yeah. not just from an employee standpoint, for, but from a product and service standpoint. Yeah. They're choosing products, choosing services, and choosing jobs based mm -hmm. on the alignment of their values with the yeah. values of the company that represents Absolutely. those products and services or those positions. It's almost like we need a Tinder for organizations. <laughs> 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 you can swipe right or swipe left based on is it in line with how I'm Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, yeah. Oh, I love that. For me, I think uh, business is personal boils down to one negative and one positive input. Mm -hmm. So the negative input for me was when, was when, is when people say, look, it's not personal, it's just business. And that's usually at the end of a conversation where they've made a decision that's going to hurt you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then, of course, it's personal. And you say, oh, yeah, it's fine, it's just business, it's not personal. But then you walk away without the win. But you can still have conversations that are, are negatively impacting. Of course. We want to use the word negatively impacting. It's yeah. about the positioning and it's about change management and it's about people understanding the whys. Mm -hmm. And at school, 
I remember my parents always being called in because they thought I was naughty. <laughs> it's not because I was naughty, it's because I always asked why. Yeah. Why, why, why? You know, you can regurgitate stuff from a textbook, but unless I understand why, mm -hmm. then it didn't work. And I think the same thing in business is that um, business is personal because unless every single person in the organisation understands why they're mm -hmm. there yeah. and what their impact is, whether it's a driver or whether it's a C level individual, yeah. then it, it isn't personal. Yeah, that, so. that leads me to my to the positive input uh, is Muhammad and ketchup, actually. Right, yeah, ketchup is, uh, is. Okay, so I did some consulting for a company in Oman that are the number one producers of ketchup in the region. They're amazing, very good at making ketchup. And I thought, you know what? So I met this guy on, on the line, his name is Muhammad, and I thought, you know what, I, I don't know what, uh, how he woke up in the morning one day and said, oh, I'm gonna be a manufacturer of ketchup, or if that was something he dreamed about as a kid. I know my uh, sister-in-law, she loves ketchup, but you know, nobody, yeah, exactly. But nobody wakes up in the morning and says, oh man, you know what, I just really wanna manufacture ketchup for the rest of my life. So I asked Muhammad, I was like, why are you here? And he's like, oh no, I'm here, not because I'm passionate about ketchup, I'm here because I'm passionate about my kids. I've got kids, they're in school, they need to be educated and that's why I'm here, you know, making an exchange of time and services for finances in order to provide a better uh, service to my family. So I thought that's a really excellent way to look at uh, a manufacturing position and actually all positions is that people aren't there, generally speaking, because they're aligned necessarily with the goals and vision and mission of the, of the company. They may be, as you said, Claire, aligned with the values for sure but they may not be passionate about manufacturing ketchup. However, they're definitely passionate about their families and they see that their contribution to manufacturing ketchup is a contribution to achieving their personal goals. And it may be that they want education for their kids, they want better health care for their parents, they might want to buy an island or a new car at some point or take a nice holiday every once in a while. So everybody's goals are different. But the reason that they participate in the organization is entirely personal. Absolutely. It's not corporate. Absolutely. What do you think, Lula? Absolutely, I agree. I mean, it's especially for an entrepreneur, it's, it's actually very personal. Mm -hmm. And throughout the, your journey as an entrepreneur, you go through a lot of you know, different life cycles from, uh, you know, from trying to convince your first customers to trying to raise the first round of money yeah. to trying to convince someone to join your company. Mm -hmm. and, and every no that you get is, is you, you, obviously there's a, there's a lesson behind it, but it's also uh, uh, hurtful as well and it, it is personal yeah, and sure. I did hear it uh, that it's not personal uh, a lot of mm -hmm. times and I know that it, it, it shouldn't be but it, it cannot not be especially right. for entrepreneurs especially for entrepreneurs uh, and and you're right especially if it's said in the context of delivering bad news um, that's also uh, I mean that, that would there's no way it wouldn't be taken personal then yeah, uh, that's right. if that's the case um, maybe, maybe not so much in, in the corporate environment. I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe you're willing to um, accept more um, uh, rejection or comments or, or so on. But when mm. it comes to entrepreneurship, I think it's very different because you're so passionate about <laughs> it, and and it's v very difficult to sure. uh, to be given uh, news or. or uh, mm -hmm. well, I think even in a corporate setting, uh, someone with a with a typical nine to five desk job, I think if they're not connecting with their, with their role at work in a way that's meaningful to them personally, then they're wasting a third of their lives. Because we're, I mean, you, for as long as you're with that company, you're there for you know, a year, 10 years, doesn't matter. For the, for the period of time that you're sitting in that corporate environment, you're dedicating a third of your life to that team, to that community. And if you're not passionate about what you're doing, you may not have to be passionate about ketchup, but if you're not passionate about the values that you represent or the people that are around you, then of course you're just, you're burning a third of your life every day. And why would you want to do that? And I think more and more employees are starting to realize that they have the opportunity to move around within a company or two other companies in order to find that sense of meaning and purpose. And when you provide meaning and you provide purpose in an employee's role, whether it's at Muhammad's manufacturing job on a ketchup line or somebody in HR or somebody in, in finance, it, it doesn't matter. Where, when you're able to provide that meaning and that sense of purpose to an employee or to an entrepreneur, that's when people start living their lives and their productivity goes up. I totally agree. I mean, I love that story about JFK when he goes to NASA. So the bridge mm. version is he goes to NASA on one of his little trips and of course he's surrounded by sycophantic people who are all kind of oh, the president's come, the president's come, and the president makes time for the cleaner. Mm. And he shit the janitor's hand and he said, you know, hi, I'm you know, JFK, who are you? 
and the janitor responded with his name. And he goes, oh, what do you do? So he's trying to engage, you know, yeah, yeah. trying to engage with the janitor, full knowing he's a yeah. cleaner. And the cleaner responded by saying, I, put, I help put man on the moon. Wow. And for me, that was a really, really powerful story because he actually, he saw the bigger purpose. Yeah. So whilst he appreciated he had his role as a janitor, you know, the small things, interventions he was doing each day aided yeah. getting man on the moon. And I really, really loved that story. But I, I hear what you're saying. I, I fear that. I, and I think this can be implemented in every company, but I think it comes down to lazy leadership. Mm. So I think as leaders or as managers, we have a duty of care to install that vision and the values. Yeah. But um, it's, I, I rarely see it done well. And yeah. to your point, then people don't really know why they're going to work. They mm -hmm. don't know how they're impacting and they're not listened to. So the engagement piece around, um, if I'm gonna sell myself to you every single day as, a, as an employee, what, what, what's in it for me? Yeah. And I think the what's in it for me thing's becoming more and more of a, a prominent question when you've got the new generation of folk coming in saying, okay, you know, what's in it for me if yeah, I come yeah, to work yeah. every day? And um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a contract, I think, yeah. between employee and um, employer now. Yeah, that's um, true. So. I think, um, yeah, personally, I've led a lot of strategy discussions with, uh, with companies here in Europe, around the world, helping them to produce their corporate vision, mission, values, yeah. and goals. In the beginning, when I started, it was about 15 years ago, I did my first kind of corporate um, strategy sessions and that sort of thing. And it was fine just to deal with the corporate language, but now I don't do it anymore. As of about, I don't know, six or seven years ago, I stopped doing corporate alone. And now I don't talk about vision, mission, values, and goals unless I'm also talking about the personal mission, vision, values, and goals of the people sitting around the table making those decisions. Mm -hmm. Because actually that's where it comes from. It's a conglomeration of the values of the people around the table, the, the goals of the people around the table. They're all there to improve the quality of their lives and those of their kids and to improve their career. So they have personal vision. They have personal goals. And it's only when we uh, acknowledge those things, bring them up onto the table and then see, okay, so what, what kind of game can we play better than anyone else on the world with this combination of, of talent? And they start to understand. Uh, you mentioned the lazy leadership, which is actually an interesting comment because, again, when you're an entrepreneur, you, you, it's all about selling your vision, right? Yeah. So, so that vision, mission, even though it might not be written as a statement, mm -hmm. it's, it's there from day one. That's right. Uh, That's you true. need to convince people to join you, uh, sometimes for less pay, sometimes for equity, sometimes for, uh, you know, uh, uh, different kind of uh, combination. But, uh, but it's so important that they're bought into the vision from day one, mm -hmm. irrespective of their job within the startup. Uh, yeah. Everyone is, is uh, bought in. And you're right, potentially, when, when companies get bigger, maybe they become complacent. Maybe, mm -hmm. uh, maybe they don't think that uh, there is a need for the manufacturing guy to, have a, you know, to believe in, in, in something bigger. And I think this is where the problem lies. Yeah, but this is changing as well. I mean, that's why a lot of uh, management have uh, um, difficulty managing millennials. And everyone talks <laughs> about the millennials <laughs> and how like, they, they, <laughs> they're difficult to manage. But I mean, why? Because because they you know they they have certain values. Mm -hmm. They want something out of uh, the job. They want more fulfillment. Yeah. Uh, they're not afraid to walk away from a job. And and these are things that are very new. Uh, yeah, you know, before yeah. you used to be in a job for you know twenty life, years, forty yeah, yeah. years for yeah. life exactly. And now that's all of that's changing. So yeah, there's a there's an implicit demand among millennials for meaning and purpose as a part of the job offer, right? Like mm -hmm. you have the job offer and it's okay. You get. Uh, four weeks of holiday, you get your flight tickets back, you get your medical care, you get this is your salary. But there's an implicit now demand for meaning. They're, they want to have life fulfillment because they understand they're sacrificing a good chunk of time that they're never going to get back. Exactly. It's that right? realization that you mentioned in the beginning that I'm spending, a, a, you know, two thirds of my life yeah. uh, doing something. I better like it. Otherwise, yes. it's, a, it's, a, it's a big yeah, problem. It needs, uh, needs to be it's meaningful. It's a big problem, especially yeah. if it's taking you away from you know, time from your family, time from your children, time social from media. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> social media. Uh, from social media, well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, then you really have to, to weigh it and, uh, and see how, how important it is to get that mm -hmm. salary for you to stick around or, sure. or if there are other options. So I think maybe... That's why freelancing is very big, sorry. Uh, that's uh, no, why, absolutely. I mean, that's why, you know, there's uh, research now in the US. We don't have numbers in this part of the world, but mm -hmm. in the US, 
Uh, by 2020, they estimate 50% of the uh, working population will be uh, freelancing. Yeah, I've heard that stat um, actually. So it's incredible, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. That tells you <laughs> that tells you a lot. Yeah, it, uh, corporations are breaking apart as service centers, and so you'll be able to actually build the company that you want out of the freelancers that are available mm -hmm. for the price that you want to pay. Yeah, I restructured yeah. one uh, one family group here about two years ago. Uh, second generation leadership. Yeah. So the first generation, the founder, he had he had passed away. Al mm -hmm. Hamo. It's an amazing guy, uh, but he had built the whole company up from his blood, sweat, and tears over the yeah. course of the lifetime of his son. Yeah. So his son grew up as a child in the hallways of that business, right? And so that business was like the de facto other child of the father. And you know, so when the father died and the, and the son came on, it was his responsibility on behalf of the family to lead that company. Well, he wasn't particularly passionate about what the company did, but he was particularly passionate about his father's legacy. Yeah. Right? So he had to protect that legacy because if the, if the company goes down after the father passes away, well then it's like burying dad all over again. Yeah, totally. right? So in that sense, the survival of the company was the survival of their father's memory. And it was, for them, it was intensely personal. So at the end of the restructuring process, I went through the mission and vision values and goals with them. Uh, with the, um, the new chairman and his executive team. Mm -hmm. And I asked them around the table because I had done their personal values, their personal vision, as well as the corporate vision and values. Yeah. So I asked them, is this the kind of company that you want to dedicate a third of your life to? And each one of them, is this the kind of company you want to dedicate a third of your life to? Because that's what you're actually doing. That's the transaction you're making. That's the trade-off. And one by one, they're like, yes, absolutely. I want to, I want to do this for a third of my life, for as long as I'm with this company. And then when I got to the chairman and I asked him, I said, is this the kind of com is this the company that your father built? And he just, right there in the boardroom, uh, broke down crying. Because I'd like to think sometimes, uh, as an employee or employer or a leader or a manager, you win hearts and minds, not just work output. So that's why I liked that story, and that's why I kind of brought the family group dynamic in, because I think the family group is so much more personal, it's more hearts and minds. Mm -hmm. And you need to win them as well as the values piece. You need to get people to understand the story and the legacy as well, right. for, the, for them to feel part of the fabric of, of, a, of a group like that. So let me ask you, Lulu, what are, what are your values? What kinds of values are you looking for in the people that you partner with uh, at Nabish? Interesting. Um, for partners, definitely, I think it would be, um, it would be honesty. I think honesty is very important. Mm -hmm. Um, even if you if you have good or bad news, I think being honest is, is always very important. Um, I think it aligns a lot with how I am as well as a, as a person, and um, and I try to be uh, genuine and honest as you know all the time. Yeah. And uh, and I would expect that people um, do the same. And yeah. if they're not, I actually get quite disappointed. Um, um, I like people that are passionate, uh, basically that have passion for what they do. It really upsets me when I see people that uh, like squander their lives, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and do things that they're not passionate about. Um, especially, for example, when you meet employees sometimes of a company and they talk badly about the company. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, yeah. and that really upsets me because, I, I, it's, um, again, it happens, but it, it shouldn't be. It's, yeah, it's just right. wrong. Yeah, that's your team. Uh, <laughs> no, yeah. They're it's, it's, ambassadors it's, of your it's, brand. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, so this is also very important for you to have that, uh, that passion. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I'm talking about partners now because you asked me yeah, of what do we look for. Yeah, of course. So, so for them to be passionate about what they do as well is very important and honest. Um, I think, yeah, I think this is, uh, this, those would be the two big ones. Uh, passion basically. and honesty, I like that. Yeah, because if they're not passionate, then I will lose interest as well in yeah, working with them. Yeah, of course, of course. Claire? No, I like those, you chose the best ones. Um, <laughs> so I'll choose the ones that's slightly more left field, because that's what I'm known for. Um, so when I'm hiring people, um, um, I like to think that Trust, trustworthy as much as that I don't micromanage. So I'm hiring this person because I'm taking them at that face value. Mm -hmm. um, I like people, I, I look for values around um, disruptivity. Mm, wow. So I, I do really enjoy meeting people who uh, not necessarily push the envelope, who, who can quickly assess a situation and, and look to see how it can be sure. um, improved, look yeah, for efficiencies, sure. look for new ways of thinking. That's because I ask why, why, why all the time. <laughs> um, I like 
No, there's a fine line, like you said, that between um, between brave and arrogance. But I like people who, um, once again, um, are a, able to, who feel confident enough to mm -hmm. to question things and to um, get people on board and, and take them on journeys. I quite mm -hmm. like individuals who have that kind of that kind of value. Yeah, yeah. You know, somebody who somebody who walks in and just does is black and white and does the same old, same old. There's a, there's roles yep. for them. Yep. But also, I really appreciate people who who like to go into an organisation. Always think about innovation. Always think about sure. change. Always yeah. think about how can I um, leave a leave a legacy, whether that's just um, rebuilding a process or looking at automation. Or and sometimes sure. brave is about that as well, isn't it? When you're looking at automation, you could be actually um, changing the way mm -hmm. people work dramatically yeah, and sure. being brave enough to make comments around that as well. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I have uh, five core values that I've been living by for a number of years. I'm going to continue to live by them. Passion is actually one of my five values. So I totally align with you on that. Passion, destiny, I think people should have a, I have a, a strong sense of purpose in my life. So I think destiny is really important to me. Uh, generosity, to be able to give a little bit more than you should. Uh, curiosity drives absolutely everything that I do. Curiosity is my yeah. master value. Yeah. It's behind it's almost everything. So the idea, you know, uh, like you said in the beginning, asking why, why do we do it this way? Why do we call this the best practice, <laughs> right? We call it the best practice because that's the best that we know of now, but yeah. is there something better than our best? And that curiosity kind of drives me. And then loyalty. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. those, those who are with me tend to stay with me. Yeah, so. and that's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you know we've we've also been been good corporate citizens as well as good. Yeah, of course. Good citizens, good people. You know, yeah, I think there's there's a lot to say for uh, treating others how you want to be treated yourself. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, we ham it and ham it down depending on our audience. But at the end of the end of the day, I think you know um, I like to be able to sleep at night. Yeah. Um. So that's really yeah, important sure. to me too. So we're getting into a new technological age, not just in digital marketing, but in actual computation. So there was a recent uh, discussion between Joe Rogan and Elon Musk mm -hmm. about artificial intelligence and mm -hmm. its impact on uh, business. And as we discuss business is personal, so more and more artificial intelligence is, is going to take over a lot of business decisions. And so those decisions, even though they'll have personal impact, won't be made with any personal motive at all. So a purchasing decision will be made by a piece of software mm -hmm. rather than somebody standing uh, across from you at a negotiating table. So how do you feel about uh, the depersonalization of business decisions? It's, it's happening, I think, whether you, know, whether, whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, uh, it's already happening and uh, it's, it's, it's going to continue going in that direction. Uh, the argument to that is that while it may uh, uh, make some jobs obsolete, it will create a lot of new jobs as well. Sure. Um, so, so we don't know actually how the, the, the future is going to look like and maybe, uh, maybe having a machine uh, do a procurement job basically, uh, <laughs> maybe it is better, who knows, yeah. I mean, <laughs> honestly I, I don't yeah. have uh, a lot of comment on that, but yeah, I, think sure. it's, I think it's definitely something that no one can uh, measure or, or no one would know how it's going to be, it's, it's just changing quite fast and uh, and I think, yeah, a lot of jobs are going to be obsolete because of that. Even, I mean, I read there was a research uh, uh, a while back um, basically that said that even things like, you know, AI would uh, potentially write stories, mm -hmm. uh, books, uh, novels, yeah. and, and, and things like that. I mean, it's... Exactly. It's, uh, Waiting for the first piece of Lawyers as well, uh, <laughs> legal jobs will be... Uh, <laughs> would be affected. Everyone's going to be affected true. in a way yeah. or another. It's so true. I work with AI now. Do you? So yeah, I do. What's the application? So we, um, I, I do a lot with um, IBM, Google, Watson, those kind okay, of challenges. Wow. So um, I think like you've said, and what, it's going to be interesting to see where it goes because I think with everything there's a negative and a positive connotation with it. So the positive connotations I can think in terms of collapsing work processes. So we use it at work, for example, in um, product identification. Mm -hmm. So I do a lot of work on research and one of the research projects we did was with women and we asked them to take photographs of their top three makeup items. Wow. 
And of course, when we run it through the analytics very quickly, but quicker than any human being, we're able to do a lot of um, data uh, yeah. segmentation and, and, um, and, and um, come up with lots of information around those products that faster than any human could do. And absolutely, I love that. Once mm -hmm. again, though, that is putting someone out of a job. But yeah, of to the client, we've collapsed the time it took for them to get that data. So, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a catch all for, yeah. for everything. And what you said, uh, interestingly, about, you know, AI replacing things like the procurement and lawyers. You see, for me, it's really interesting because, you know, if you're programming AI, then there's black and white mm -hmm. and it will operate in black and white and the output will be black and white. But in those kind of, especially in legal, yeah. there has to be, should there be an, a human intervention? Does the human, human beings in, in terms of their spectrum of emotions need to be involved to make some of the decisions? Mm -hmm. so there's legal things like contract reading and writing that, you know, would you feel AI comfortable doing it? Yeah, I would. Would I want an AI judge sitting and listening to me in court? <laughs> Probably not. Even though they say AI oh, can read face and do voice sentiment. Yeah, sure. You know, you're still handing it over to, yeah, to a machine. Yeah. So I think it's going to be interesting, like you said, to see where it goes. Um, and I've been doing some work with, uh, I did, wrote a paper actually on and how, how AI is used in Amazon. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely spot on in terms of, you know, uh, robots replacing on, on the production line and, and in yeah. the future they're thinking about doing 3D printing so they own blueprints and people mm. just print it, you know, the products at leisure in the future. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, from a business perspective it sounds fantastic, but yeah. are we missing the human intervention? Are we missing the, the consumer experience would change so much? And if mm -hmm. we apply it in the workplace, you know, you're, you right. could be peer ranked against a machine. I'm not sure yeah, if I yeah. feel so comfortable about that. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But so it's interesting. No, it's so true. I, I think uh, even now it's, is it Sichi that's using AI for recruitment? Mm. Uh, so they're actually evaluating the emotional, uh, mm. based on the emotions of candidates, mm -hmm. the, the writing that they produce and this, their speech patterns, mm. they're determining the potential of those candidates for, for housing certain skills in the future. Do they have potential? So the, now the potential of somebody can be judged by AI in a meaningful way for a corporation to make a hiring decision. Do you not think in the future, like 50 years time, we'll have courts who say there were bias, bias decisions were made when it, AI was introduced and all of a sudden there'll mm -hmm. be like uh, positive discrimination uh, cases where people feel that they don't want to be measured by those because, for example, yeah. learning difficulties. People maybe on autism or something like that. Yeah. How would they how would they react in front of some of these technologies, and how would they be measured and judged yeah, I don't in know. terms of diversity and inclusion? Mm -hmm. How does that fit into it? It would have a, a tremendous negative effect on the the tolerance agenda. Mm. I think absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, uh, speaking of the tolerance agenda, you here in the UAE, and there's a lot of companies that are uh, doing layoffs now. They're cutting back a little bit. They're saying uh, the economy is sl a little bit sluggish. And so that has an effect on uh, the morale of those companies when they have to do that. So there's a couple of there's a few cutbacks I know in a couple of my clients' companies recently, and that has a negative impact on the rest of the, the company in terms of morale. Can you speak to that in terms of the, the you know when we talk about business being personal, when you have to lay someone off, and I've I've had to do it myself, so I know that pain when you sit and say, look, it's a business decision. It's not personal. It's not personal. <laughs> Uh, we're just making a business yeah. decision and unfortunately you're going to lose your job over this business decision. Yeah. Uh, I've had that, I've been in that painful situation and now there's a lot of people in the UAE that are experiencing that. So in that sense, it's intensely personal. But what is the, what's then the overall effect on the morale of the company and on uh, the, per the productivity of um, the other workers? Definitely impact the, the morale if obviously if it's not handled properly, yeah. uh, if it's not managed properly. I think that these are very sensitive uh, issues. I've been through actually a redundancy. Uh, oh really? Uh, en masse, where where hundreds of us were were let go on uh, on the same day, and we were called in the morning um, to the manager's office, and we were handed in an envelope, and yeah. then off we go by the end of the day. <laughs> did, you, did you know it was coming? No, so we're already we, I mean, we, it it's, it's funny you say that, because we, we thought it would come, yeah. and then a week before that yeah. happened, uh, we, were, uh, we were on a company team building exercise at a nice hotel, and basically, we were told that you know the company is doing great, and like there's there's no uh, there's no worries, and yeah, your jobs yeah. are safe, and so on. And then one week later, uh, uh, a lot of us were let go. 
and and it's uh, it's uh, it's a wake up call, mm -hmm. right? I mean, uh, it's uh, it's. Uh, I mean, I've been I've been on both sides where I was part of a redundancy, and I also had to let people go yeah. uh, myself and and th throughout my my journey, and um, it's it's. Uh, it's not, there's no easy way of doing it, but it's definitely a wake up call. And for me, actually, it was after that redundancy yeah. that, I, that I started thinking about entrepreneurship. Yeah. And I started thinking about, okay, uh, I was in the company, I was doing great, I was mm -hmm. getting promoted. I, I didn't think, I wasn't planning on leaving. Yeah, sure. Uh, and it just happened, you know, just one day I had just like got married, got, got, came back from my uh, honeymoon bought an apartment and then all oh of a sudden gosh. yeah, 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 yeah. you lose wow. the job and yeah. and I think it, it it happens and and that's why people shouldn't be too complacent in their mm -hmm. jobs and that's why uh, the idea of uh, you know um, always uh, up like skilling yourself and mm -hmm. always uh, learning new things and being curious and uh, and maybe even changing jobs I think people that are in a job for 10 years are especially uh, 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 in a dangerous position. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I mean, I know people, friends of mine that have been in the corporate life uh, with one company for like 17 years or 18 years. Yeah. And even if they want to leave, they don't know who would, mm -hmm. would hire them, yeah. uh, you know, because yeah. they're so senior within the company yeah. and they're kind of, they're, they're, they're shackled in Such a way. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're too, they're too scared to make an entrepreneurial move yeah. uh, because they have commitments, they have a certain lifestyle, and, and, and they're really stuck. Yeah, but that, these people, if they are let go for a reason or another, you know, it's, it's which, which happens. Uh, so, so I don't know what the remedy is, but, uh, but it, it does happen. I think people should start believing that it, it might happen, uh, you know, having a full-time job is not for life anymore. Mm -hmm. Job security is not uh, for life anymore. Yeah, sure. You might lose your job at any time. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we embrace that chaos now. I think millennials, uh, on average, turn over their jobs every two years. I'll so be a millennial forever then. You'll be a millennial forever. <laughs> All right, well, I want to say thank you so much for joining me for our very first podcast. It was an excellent conversation, and I think we're going to revisit this topic again. So thank you uh, to Claire Elliott from employee.com. That's M-P-L-O-Y-I-I.com for those of you who are following on the podcast. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you so much, Lulu, from uh, nabish.com. That's N-A-B-B-E-S-H.com. Cool. Yeah, you can find them there. All right. Thank you very much, Corey. My pleasure. Thank you, My Corey. pleasure. Thank you for joining me. Thanks.